On the morning of November 17, 2013, the Midwest awoke to a rare high-risk tornado alert, and what followed in Illinois shattered records as over two dozen twisters tore through the state. Among them was the most terrifying tornado ever caught on camera, as it carved a half-mile wide path through Washington. With just 16 minutes of warning, lives were thrown into chaos, but something remarkable kept the death toll from spiraling. How did forecasters and a community face a disaster on a scale they had never seen, and what lessons still remain hidden in the wreckage? On November 17, 2013, the Midwest faced an outbreak that would redefine what was possible for tornadoes in late autumn. In a single day, 75 to 77 tornadoes swept across seven states, from Missouri to Michigan. Illinois stood at the heart of the disaster. 25 tornadoes touched down within its borders, making it the deadliest and most expensive November tornado day the state had ever recorded. Statewide losses approached $1 billion, with the city of Washington alone suffering over $800 million in damage. The scale of the threat was clear from the start. Before sunrise, meteorologists at the Storm Prediction Center in Norman, Oklahoma, issued a rare high-risk outlook for parts of Illinois and neighboring states. High-risk days are reserved for the most dangerous combinations of weather ingredients, days when the atmosphere is primed for violent storms and widespread destruction. That morning, forecasters saw all the signs, powerful winds high above the ground, unseasonably warm and humid air sweeping north, and the kind of wind shear that can twist thunderstorms into tornadoes spawning supercells. This was not a typical November cold front. The conditions were so volatile that experts compared the setup to the classic spring outbreaks of the Southern Plains. The Storm Prediction Center. Early warnings set the tone for local offices, emergency managers, and the public. That morning, Illinois residents woke to a weather threat more severe than anything they had seen in years. The numbers alone, dozens of tornadoes, entire neighborhoods at risk, and a high-risk warning from the nation's top severe weather forecasters told the story of a day when the ordinary rules no longer applied. A powerful jet stream raced overhead that Sunday, carving a deep trough across the central United States. At ground level, unseasonably warm and humid air surged north from the Gulf of Mexico, pushing temperatures into the low 70s across Illinois, more typical of late spring than mid-November. Dew points climbed into the mid-60s, saturating the lower atmosphere with moisture. This created a volatile mix. The warmth and humidity provided the fuel, while the upper-level winds supplied the spark. Meteorologists tracking the setup noted how the wind changed direction and speed at different heights, a phenomenon known as wind shear. Near the surface, winds blew from the south, but just a few thousand feet up, they veered sharply and accelerated, reaching over 60 miles per hour. This strong shear allowed thunderstorms to tilt and spin, increasing the odds that any storm could evolve into a supercell. Supercells are the giants of severe weather, capable of producing the most violent tornadoes on record. Instability continued to build as the morning progressed. Atmospheric soundings from central Illinois showed a deep layer of warm, buoyant air beneath colder air aloft, creating a setup primed for explosive storm growth. There was little to hold these storms back. The usual cap, a layer of warm air that suppresses thunderstorms, had weakened, making it easy for updrafts to punch through. By mid-morning, computer models and real-time radar already hinted at the potential for discrete, long-lived supercells ahead of the main cold front. All the classic ingredients for a major tornado outbreak had come together, a trough and jet stream, abundant warmth and moisture, and exceptional wind shear. The atmosphere was not just unstable, it was primed for rapid, severe storm development. Forecasters knew that once storms fired, they could move quickly and become dangerous in minutes, setting the stage for the warnings and life-or-death decisions that would follow. At 10.50 a.m. Central Standard Time, the National Weather Service Office in Lincoln, Illinois, issued a tornado warning for Washington and the surrounding communities. The warning did not mince words. It specified an estimated arrival time around 11.05 a.m. For people in the path, this was the first official signal that the threat had moved from possible to imminent. 
Meteorologists on the warning desk had been tracking the supercell's rapid development on radar, watching for the telltale signs of rotation and organization that could mean a tornado was forming. Ten minutes later, at 11 a.m., the situation escalated. Spotters confirmed a tornado near East Peoria at 10.58 a.m., just southwest of Washington. This confirmation fed directly into the warning chain, prompting an immediate review and upgrade of the alert. The radar operators, now seeing a tightening hook echo and increasing velocity signatures, relayed the urgency to emergency managers and broadcasters. By 11.06 a.m., the language of the warning changed. The National Weather Service issued an updated message. A large and extremely dangerous tornado was on the ground, what meteorologists call a particularly dangerous situation, PDS. This was not just a technical upgrade, it was a direct call to action, meant to cut through any hesitation. Residents who received the first warning at 10.50 a.m. had about 16 minutes to act before the tornado arrived. In the world of severe weather, that is a significant window especially with a storm moving at highway speeds. The warning chain worked as designed, radar detection, spotter confirmation, and rapid public alerts, all within a tight, coordinated timeline. For many in Washington, those 16 minutes would become the most important of their lives. At 10.59 a.m., the tornado touched down just southeast of East Peoria, Illinois. The first signs were subtle, a sudden drop in pressure, a deepening roar, and the unmistakable rotation on the radar screens at the National Weather Service office. Meteorologists watched as the supercell signature tightened. Between 10.58 a.m. and 11.03 a.m., the radar displayed a classic hook echo, a tornadic vortex signature that left no doubt about what was unfolding. The tornado's initial contact with the ground was forceful enough to snap power poles and strip roofs from homes. Within moments, it crossed Interstate 474 and then Interstate 74, gaining intensity as it moved northeast. The storm's forward speed, clocked at nearly 60 miles per hour, gave residents and forecasters little time to react. For the meteorologists on duty, every scan brought new urgency. The dual polarization radar began to show signs of debris being lifted, an early hint of the destruction about to unfold. As the tornado advanced, its width expanded rapidly, approaching half a mile across. The radar's low correlation coefficient and reflectivity values confirmed that large pieces of debris, wood, insulation, and household items were being thrown high into the atmosphere. Inside the forecast office, the team relayed this information in real time to emergency managers and broadcasters, knowing that each update could mean the difference between life and death. By the time the tornado neared the outskirts of Washington, it had already strengthened to a formidable force. The supercell driving it showed no signs of weakening, its rotation as tight and organized as any meteorologist could recall. The window for action was closing fast. The tornado was no longer just a possibility on a computer screen, it was a violent growing presence on the ground, bearing down on a city with only minutes to spare. At 11.06 a.m., the tornado struck the southwest edge of Washington with the full force of an EF-4. Winds reached 190 miles per hour as the storm crossed into the Woodridge Trace subdivision. Well-built homes along English Oak Street were swept from their foundations, leaving only bare concrete slabs and scattered debris fields. In some cases, entire structures vanished, their remains carried blocks away or lofted high into the air. One resident sheltering in a basement later died from injuries, evidence of the storm's overwhelming power even below ground level. A few blocks north, Georgetown Commons apartments took a direct hit. The upper floors of several buildings collapsed and a pickup truck was hurled from a parking lot and wrapped around a tree. Residents who had taken shelter in interior bathrooms or ground floor units described the sound as a freight train, followed by the sudden collapse of walls and ceilings. Survival depended on seconds and the decision to move below grade. In the aftermath, those emerging from basements found their homes unrecognizable. The landscape flattened and littered with splintered wood, insulation, and personal belongings. The tornado's path widened as it roared through the heart of Washington. Rows of houses, built to modern codes, were reduced to rubble. Vehicles were tossed into yards and driveways, some flipped or mangled beyond recognition. 
Commercial buildings, including an auto parts store and golf course facilities, suffered heavy damage. Hillcrest Golf Course was forced to close for repairs after losing several structures. Throughout the event, dual polarization radar captured a persistent debris ball over the city. The signature was so pronounced that meteorologists knew in real time that large pieces of homes and businesses were being lofted thousands of feet into the atmosphere. For the families who had taken cover just minutes earlier, the destruction above ground was nearly complete, but the decision to shelter made all the difference. After tearing through Washington, the tornado pressed northeast, showing no signs of letting up. At 11.12 a.m., it crossed the county line into Woodford, just southeast of Metamora. The landscape shifted from dense neighborhoods to open fields and scattered farmsteads, but the storm's core remained violent. Emergency crews in these rural areas faced a different challenge. Long stretches of damaged roads, downed power lines, and isolated homes suddenly cut off from help. By 11.17 a.m., the tornado neared Roanoke. Here, the damage pattern changed. Some areas saw barns flattened and grain bins twisted apart, while others found homes with roofs torn away but walls left standing. The tornado's intensity wavered between severe and devastating, but the threat never eased. Volunteer fire departments and local responders began moving from house to house, checking for survivors and relaying information to county dispatchers who were already stretched thin. The storm's relentless motion carried it further. At 11.31 a.m., it approached the outskirts of Minonk, skirting just west of town and threatening more rural properties. Radar images captured a persistent, well-defined rotation, confirming what residents on the ground were experiencing an unbroken chain of destruction that moved faster than most people could process. Even as the tornado passed by, the sense of danger lingered, with debris scattered for miles and the air heavy with dust and insulation. Finally, at 11.47 a.m., after nearly 50 minutes on the ground, the tornado lifted in Livingston County near the communities of Dana and Long Point. The path behind it stretched across fields, highways, and small towns, each bearing scars of the storm's passage. For many rural families, the aftermath meant not just lost homes, but a long wait for help as responders worked their way along the storm's track, one farm, and crossroads at a time. Survey teams arrived in Washington to document the aftermath with a precision reserved for the most severe tornado events. The numbers they recorded tell the story of a storm that defied expectations even among seasoned meteorologists. The tornado reached EF4 intensity with winds measured at 190 miles per hour. Its path stretched for 46.2 miles, cutting through neighborhoods, farmland, and small towns over the course of 48 minutes. Despite the scale of destruction, the official count stood at three fatalities and 125 injuries along the tornado's track, a toll considered remarkably low given the level of devastation. Economic losses in Washington alone exceeded $800 million, accounting for the vast majority of Illinois' damage that day. Inspectors noted entire blocks where homes were reduced to bare foundations, yet many families survived by sheltering below ground. The storm's power was further confirmed by radar, which tracked debris lofted high into the atmosphere and carried northeast, with some reports of personal effects turning up near the outer edges of the Chicago area. Each data point, from wind speed to dollar loss, marks the scale of what happened and sets the stage for the lived experiences behind these statistics. Families in Washington that Sunday morning faced a threat that was nearly invisible until it was too late. The tornado moved at nearly 60 miles per hour, faster than many drivers on the highway, leaving residents with only moments to make life or death decisions. Heavy rain wrapped around the tornado's core turning it into a gray, shifting wall rather than a classic funnel. Some described it as a solid mass of water and debris, impossible to recognize until the roar and wind hit. For many, there was no clear visual cue, just the sudden darkness, the rising wind, and the urgent tone of warnings blaring from phones, radios, and television. The language used by the National Weather Service that morning was direct and urgent. Phrases such as large and extremely dangerous and particularly dangerous situation cut through the usual routine, urging people to act immediately. Sirens, emergency alerts, and social media posts all carried the same message, take shelter now. 
In those final minutes, church congregations moved into basements, families rushed to interior rooms, and drivers pulled off roads, guided not by what they could see, but by the warnings they trusted. The speed, the rain-wrapped darkness, and the relentless alerts shaped every decision, reminding everyone that survival sometimes depends on acting before you can see the danger. Federal, state, and local agencies moved quickly to support Washington after the tornado, launching a coordinated relief effort that began even as debris still covered the streets. Within days, search and rescue teams, utility crews, and volunteer organizations set up operations providing shelter, food, and basic medical care for displaced families. The scale of the destruction tested every level of government, but also revealed gaps in the nation's disaster safety net. Many homeowners learned that insurance would not cover all losses, and debates over federal aid thresholds became a flashpoint. At first, some residents faced uncertainty as FEMA weighed whether Washington's median income and insurance coverage met the strict standards for individual assistance. Public outcry and advocacy by state officials eventually led to a major disaster declaration, unlocking both public and individual aid for survivors. Even with this support, the path to recovery stretched on for years. Some families spent months in temporary housing, waiting for repairs or new construction. The rebuilding process forced a closer look at building codes, shelter access, and the limits of insurance. For anyone living in tornado-prone regions, the lessons are clear. Know your alert sources, have a plan for shelter, preferably below ground, and do not wait for visual confirmation. Federal aid can help, but personal preparedness and community support often make the biggest difference when disaster strikes. Today, tornadoes are striking harder and farther outside their traditional season. Illinois saw more November tornadoes in 2013 than in any year on record. As climate extremes intensify, warning seconds matter more than ever. The difference between devastation and survival is how quickly we act. In the Midwest and beyond, complacency is a luxury no one can afford. Stay alert and stay safe.